Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Vlogitas. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible Truth series, we go through the Word, chapter and verse, together. And this is the last episode. We'll be in the Book of First Kings. Um, you know, uh, I want to thank all of you for uh, those of you who have stuck with us. You know, through all the times we were trying to figure out um, audio troubles and things like that, and we're you know always working to get better at that. We're still learning, um, and uh, you know, it's also can be difficult to get through all the history and you know I had mentioned before you know people are like well why is it important to know the history uh, it's not important because that we should just know the history it's important because God's plan is interwoven through the history and how God worked things together through the history and the history is full of people who made all kinds of mistakes and God so God reworked a lot of things and so you get to see how he does that you get to see um, the people who, you know, did did want to do God's will, and some who, you know, did it did it more often than others, you know. And uh, here we are at the end of uh, the book of First Kings, and we've seen one of those people that, you know, can't ever seem to, uh, you know, do the right thing. You've got Ahab; he can't ever seem to. He always seems to want to rush in for the thing that'll either be easiest right away or the thing that will benefit him the most right away, and doesn't consider that. God is a God of the long run. You know, God uh, wants us to, he, he, you know, people want the, the quick fix. They want the quick, uh, the quick solution. They want the get rich quick, quick scheme. And that just doesn't fly with God. You know, God expects long-term faithfulness. Um, and then you see, um, you know, you, you see the increased blessings at the end of the difficult season. You know, not that there aren't blessings during, um, whatever season that we're in and you know on the radio i heard uh just just today you know someone was like well i'm gonna, I'm gonna use you know talking the christian language to talk about seasons for a second and i'm like seasons is not just you know christianese seasons happen all throughout the world it's something that people all people recognize you know um no matter what what part of the world you're in there's seasons i mean i talked to a lady from the philippines one time she said well you know, we only have two seasons we have the wet season and the dry season well you know, I mean, they may only have two seasons, but those are still seasons. And, um, you know, it's um, a very difficult season for the kingdom of Israel at the time that we're, that we're reading right here. And it's because, um, you know, Ahab, this king is, he and his wife seek to push God out to the outer fringes of society. And they don't, they don't want God in there at all. And it causes a lot of issues. And so, um, you know, but God's very patient with Ahab and spends a great deal of time trying to get him to turn away. You know, God could just snuff him out and bring in a new king, but instead he he's trying to get Ahab to uh, see the light, as it will, as you as as it were. So um, let's go ahead and pray, Father. I pray for your wisdom, Lord God, as we look in these annals of of, of time, this this uh, this history that you have laid out for us to uh, be familiar with. Um, to learn from the mistakes of those who have gone before. Pray, Father God, that you would uh, bring up things, show us things, and um, help us to see um, things that have been sort of, you know, um, not lost to time, but lost to people's interests, and help us to assimilate those things into our heart through your word. Help us to see what it is you want us to see, know what it is that you want us to know. And I thank you for your wisdom. I thank you for your unfailing love. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so here in uh, 1 Kings chapter 21, I have, um, excuse me, the last part of verse 19 highlighted out. I have verse 23 and 24 highlighted out. And that's just, you know, it's just graphic. It just, um, you know, you can reveal that however you will to those who you minister to. Um, out in chapter 22 in verse uh it looks like verse 11 yeah i have a couple words that i'm going to change there um and then down in verse 17 i have uh one word to to be substituted it's not really changing anything i'm just uh substituting it for um less brutal language if you will you know because i don't know that you've got you might have little ears listening and so we're just we're just careful of that and try to be aware of that but you know, not changing God's word at all, just, you know, um, yeah, you know, just 
using softer language, you know, for those parts. And then to do the same thing in verse 20. Um, and then I have part of verse, the last part of verse 35 highlighted out, the last, the, and all of verse 38 highlighted out. And then all of verse 46 highlighted out. And so without further ado, let's get in here and uh, finish out the book of First Kings. So in uh, chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Now there was a man from Naboth, no, excuse me, excuse me, a man named Naboth, messed up the very first sentence. How do you like that? Well, that's why we do things unscripted around here, just so that you can benefit from all of the uh, impromptu hiccups that, we ha that happen from time to time. So again, verse 1, Now there was a man named Naboth from Jezreel, who owned a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of King Ahab of Samaria. One day Ahab said to Naboth, or Naboth, since your vineyard is so convenient to my palace, I would like to buy it to use as a vegetable garden. I will give you a better vineyard in exchange, or if you prefer, I will pay you for it. But Naboth replied, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance that was passed down by my ancestors. So Ahab went home angry and sullen because of Naboth's answer. The king went to bed with his face to the wall and refused to eat. And so, you know, this is kind of a childish reaction. And we do see that, um, I think that that was one of Ahab's problems is that he never, he never would grow up. You know, just um, like Paul said in the New Testament, I, uh, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child, I acted as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And so there is some aspect of his life and his rulership that he did not put away some childish things. On the face of it, it looks like this is um, a fair a fair deal. In fact, you know, here in Western civilization, we'd say, well, that's a fair, you know, he's, he's you know, the king's not just looking to buy it for, it's not like, it's not like public uh, or eminent domain where it's like, we'll just take it away and give you fair market value. No, he's actually offering to give um, him a better field in exchange. He's actually saying, I'm going to, I want to increase you, but he's not looking at the spiritual aspect of it, which God told the people, you can't transfer this inheritance of the land that I am giving to you. Um, why? Because God wanted the people to put uh, a high value on the inheritance that he had given to them. And it's not just about location. It's not just about, um, you know, um, a higher market value or, or whatever um, type of increase that we might see. But God is wanting us to put a high value upon the inheritance, and you know, um, I, I, I in the, in this particular case, uh, the guy's like, "There's a spiritual thing can, that I cannot that I cannot do this. I cannot give you this land." And uh, so the king's you know kind of childish about it, and and he's upset about it, and it looks like. It, 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 that, that's this is not the real problem. The real problem comes in when Jezebel comes in. Verse five: What's the matter? His wife Jezebel asked him, "What's made you so upset that you're not eating?" I asked Naboth to sell me his vineyard or trade it, but he refused. Ahab told her, "Are you the king of Israel or not?" Jezebel demanded. "Get up and eat something, and don't worry about it. I'll get you Naboth's vineyard." So he doesn't even question. What are you going to do? You know what's? Uh, <laughs> it's just. She's going to do some uh, cloak and dagger type of stuff here, you know, and and uh, get this vineyard for him. And it's it's interesting because the vineyard is convenient to the palace, but the kingship was established after the inheritance was given. And so then the inheritance actually trumps the kingship. It doesn't matter where the king happened to put his palace. It's like this land was given to this man by the Lord, and God made it very clear you're not to um, exchange plots. And... Um, so, but that doesn't matter to Ahab. He's like, okay, well, I'll just let my wife take care of it. And um, so verse 8 says, she, so she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and sent them to the elders and other leaders of the town where Naboth lived. In her letter, she commanded, call the citizens together for a time of fasting and give Naboth a place of honor, and then seat two scoundrels across from him who will accuse him of cursing God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. So even Jezebel knows that this is a, a very terrible thing. She's it's like you're going to have to get scoundrels to do this. These you know you're going to have to get some some men who you know don't have any scruples who are willing to do any, do or say anything for any amount of money. And so it's um it's just a bad situation all around. It's like we're going to knowingly enter into uh, a a murder con a conspiracy to murder, which is what she's doing here. 
Verse 11, so the elders and other town leaders followed the instructions Jezebel had written in the letters. They called for a fast and put Naboth at a prominent place before the people. Then the two scoundrels came and sat across from him, and they accused Naboth before all the people, saying he cursed God and the king. So he was dragged outside the town and stoned to death. The town leaders then sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned to death. So on the face of it, it looks like they're following biblical protocol, but they're, but they're, no, they're not, because God's made it, made it clear if there's an accusation against somebody, then it needs to be investigated. And, but they, they didn't do that. They just said, okay, well, you know, two witnesses, that's enough. We'll go out and stone him. No, that was wrong. Um, the people had just, this, this, is, this takes place, you know, not too long after uh, Elijah had this great victory. And these are all the same people that are involved here where, they, where the, he said, if, if God's God, serve him. If Baal's God, serve him. And they had the, the, you know, the supernatural sacrifice where fire came down from heaven, consumed the, the, the sacrifice on the altar. And all the people are like, the Lord is God. So why are they not now honoring God by following his, his law? Uh, instead, they're just like, okay, well, this is what the queen wants done. So this is what we'll do. And it's not good. Um, verse 15, when Jezebel heard the news, she said to Ahab, you know, the vineyard Naboth wouldn't sell you. Well, you can have it now. He's dead. So Ahab immediately went down to the vineyard of Naboth to claim it. But the Lord said to Elijah, Go down to meet King Ahab of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He will be at Naboth's vineyard in Jezreel, claiming it for himself. Give him this message. This is what the Lord says. Wasn't it enough that you killed Naboth? Must you rob him too? So why is God saying that Naboth is the one that did this, when it was really his wife who gave the command, and then the people were the ones that carried it out? It, it's because it was done in the king's name. Uh, Jezebel sent these letters out with the king's, in the king's name with his seal. It's as though the king has done it himself. Um, it's, it's, that's why when Jesus told us, he's like, if, uh, you know, when I send you out, if people reject you, they're, they're, not really re they're not really rejecting you. They're rejecting me who sent you. Or he said, if they accept you, they're accepting me who sent you, and they're accepting the Father who sent me. And so when God, when, when something is done in another person's name, it's as though they have done it themselves. And this is something that seems to have been largely lost in our Western civilization thinking. We don't necessarily think of, think of it this way, but it's, it's a very, it's a biblical, um, it's a biblical thing that's in place that God still recognizes that if something is done in somebody's name, it's as though they did it themselves. It's like there's a, uh, some, there's some people that claim that the New Testament, there's a part of the New Testament that they say it is, is not consistent because when the centurion sent for Jesus to uh, tell him, my servant is sick, and Jesus said, I'll come heal him. And he said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you come under my house, but speak the word from where you are, and it will, it will happen because I am also a man under authority. And when I say to my servant, do this, he does it. Or I say to, my, to a soldier, go or come, he comes. And so it's, it's this understanding of authority that when the word is spoken in the name of another, that it's as though they have said it themselves. He's like, the Caesarean tells Jesus, say it from where you are, because I understand authority. So you don't need to actually be here for it to come to pass. Just speak the word from where you are and it will happen. And it did. But the, the, the point I was trying to make is there's people that say, well, that's, that passage has some, uh, it contradicts itself because one one of the uh, gospels has it's the servant of the centurion that comes to Jesus, and another one has it that is the centurion himself that comes to Jesus. But see, it, because it's a, and they say, well, why? Well, how could it be the centurion himself and also the servant? Because when he sent the servant in his name, it was just as good as if the centurion was standing there in person in front of Jesus talking to him. And this is the same thing that God is saying here. Ahab, you're the one who murdered this man because it was done in your name using your seal. It's the same as if you had done it yourself. And so uh, God's calling him to account. So verse 20, uh, so then uh, uh, Ahab, or Elijah finds him. So my enemy, you have found me, Ahab exclaimed to Elijah. Yes, Elijah answered. I have come because you have sold yourself to what is evil in the Lord's sight. So now the Lord says, I will bring disaster on you and consume you. I will destroy every one of your male descendants, slave and free alike, anywhere in Israel. I'm going to destroy your family, as I did the family of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and the family of Baasha, king of Ahijah, or son of Ahijah, who 
uh, for you have made me very angry and have led Israel into sin. Why? Because he, he carried it out with, by the people. It was done, you know, it doesn't matter if he, if he was, there's no such thing as plausible deniability with God. God knows all things. And so it's like, it doesn't matter if he wasn't directly involved. His wife did it in his name with his knowledge. And she had the people to do it. It doesn't matter if they didn't get their hands dirty themselves. So that's what God's saying. Verse 25. No one else so completely sold himself to what was evil in the Lord's sight as Ahab did under the influence of his wife Jezebel. His worst outrage was worshiping idols just as the Amorites had done, the people whom the Lord had driven out from the land ahead of the Israelites. Um, uh, so, but, so, so again, you know, Ahab and his wife have, have gone, that's why it says no one else so completely sold himself out. Well, Ahab sold himself out because he would rush in for whatever was the most convenient for him, whatever would do him the most, um, you know, like short run, it, good, so, so much, uh, he would run in and take a hold of whatever would do him the most good in the short run without considering the, the spiritual ramifications of what he was doing. And um, on the outside, it looked like he was a very successful king. But um, on the inside, that's what God is dealing with here. And so, um, it's at verse 27, But when Ahab heard this message, he tore his clothing, dressed in burlap, and fasted. He even slept in burlap and went about in deep mourning. Then another message from the Lord came to Elijah. Do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has done this, I will not do what I promised during his lifetime. It will happen to his sons. I will destroy his dynasty. And so someone might say, well, Ahab's done or done a whole lot to anger God. Why would God let him off the hook? Because humbling yourself before the Lord goes a long way. Even, even if you're somebody who has done a whole a lot of stuff like Ahab has. And so just so, this goes to show God's mercy. It's not because Ahab, Ahab was good. And it's not even necessarily that Ahab was... Um, what was sincere maybe he was sincere in the moment but he wasn't sincere in the long run we'll see that but it's just because of god's goodness and his mercy so uh, chapter 22 for three years there was no war between aram and israel then during the third year king jehoshaphat of judah went to visit king ahab of israel during the visit the king of israel said to his officials don't you realize the town of ramath gilead belongs to us and yet we've done nothing to recapture it from the king of aram then he turned to Jehoshaphat and asked, Will you join me in battle to recover Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, Why, of course, you and I are as one. My troops are your troops, and my horses are your horses. Then Jehoshaphat added, But first let's find out what the Lord says. Because yes, King Jehoshaphat was a good king. He was the king of the, of the southern kingdom of Judah. And uh, usually there was war between those two kingdoms, but during Jehoshaphat's reign there was peace between Israel and and Judah, um, and so so Jehoshaphat's like, okay, well, we need to see what God has to say about this. Verse six. So the king so the king of Israel summoned the prophets, about four hundred of them, and asked, "Should I go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or should I hold back?" They all replied, "Yes, go right ahead. The Lord will give the king victory." But Jehoshaphat asked, "Is there not also a prophet of the Lord here? We should ask him the same question." So. Jehoshaphat recognizes false prophecy, and you remember the a while back because this is you know at least three years back, probably further, where all of the prophets of Baal and Asherah had been destroyed by the people because they finally recognized okay God's the true God, but yet um, now we are a few years later and apparently those prophets have been replaced or they're prophets who are you know sort of middle of the road they consult. God, but they also consult other gods because that was sort of what was happening before um, the the really solid Baal worship came in, and that was you know started to be done away with, but it was still in place a little bit because Ahab and Jezebel. Um, but uh, so Jehoshaphat's like, okay, well, isn't there a prophet of the Lord here? Shouldn't we imply? Shouldn't we uh, ask him the same question? Verse eight: The king of Israel replied to Jehoshaphat, "There is one more man who could consult the Lord for us, but I hate him." He never prophesies anything but trouble for me. His name is Micaiah, son of Imla. So why is he always <laughs> prophesying trouble for, for King Ahab? Because King Ahab won't give up his wickedness, and, he's, and, and Micaiah is a true prophet of God. <laughs> Jehoshaphat replied, that's not the way a king should talk. Let's hear what he has to say. So there's that childishness coming up again where it's like, I don't like what he says, so I don't want to hear from him. 
And it's like, just because you don't like what he says doesn't mean that it's not true. So Jehoshaphat's like, a king listens to the counsel of the Lord, whether they want to hear it or not. Jehoshaphat's right. Let's hear what he has to say, Jehoshaphat replied. Verse 9, So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Quick, bring Micaiah, son of Imla. King Ahab of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah, dressed in their royal robes, were sitting on thrones at the threshing floor near the gate of Samaria. All of Ahab's prophets were prophesying there in front of them. One of them, Zedekiah, son of Canana, made some iron horns and proclaimed, This is what the Lord says, With these horns you will destroy the Arameans. Verse 12, All the other prophets agreed, Yes, they said, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, for the Lord will give the king victory. Meanwhile, the messenger who went to get Micaiah said to him, Look, all the prophets are promising victory for the king. Be sure that you agree with them and promise success. Uh, well, that's the war, that's worldly counsel, right? Save your own skin. Say, just tell the king what he wants to hear. That is definitely the easy way to go. Verse 14, But Micaiah replied, As surely as the Lord lives, I will say only what the Lord tells me to say. Verse 15, When Micaiah arrived before the king, Ahab asked him, Micaiah, should we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or should we hold back? Micaiah replied sarcastically, Yes, go up and be victorious, for the king will give the king for the Lord will give the king victory. But the king replied sharply, How many times must I demand that you speak only the truth to me when you speak for the Lord? So this is like, you know, uh, by the word by the words of your own mouth are you condemned, you know. Um, it, it's it's like the king can recognize when it's not a word from the Lord. Yet when he gets a word from the Lord, he won't do what the Lord says. You know, um, and it's, thank you, it's like, it's it's just this interesting kind of paradox that, that people seem to kind of walk around with where, like, they, they say they want to hear from God, but when they finally hear from God, they don't like what God said, so they don't do what he says. And I, you know, I just remember one time reading in the New, New Testament where Jesus says, you, you, you say to me, you call me Lord, but why don't you do the things that I say? And it was like, it was like that scripture just slapped me across the face because it's true. There are things that we know that we're supposed to do and we don't do them. And so, but it's just interesting that we can recognize when it's God. The king's like, I can tell that that's not what God's telling you, Micaiah. And so it's like he's willfully ignorant of God's ways. Even though he can recognize God's voice, he doesn't want to follow God's voice, so he just chooses not to, even though he gets lots of warnings. And so, um, verse 17, Then Micaiah told him, In a vision, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains, like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, Their master has been struck down. Send them home in peace. Didn't I tell you, the king of Israel exclaimed to Jehoshaphat, He never prophesies anything but trouble for me. Then Micaiah continued, Listen to what the Lord says. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the armies of heaven around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who can entice Ahab to go into battle against Ramoth Gilead so he can be struck down? There were many suggestions. And finally, a spirit approached the Lord and said, I can do it. How will you do this? The Lord asked. And the spirit replied, I will go out and inspire all of Ahab's prophets to speak lies. You will succeed, said the Lord. Go ahead and do it. So you see, the Lord has put a lying spirit into the mouths of all your prophets, for the Lord has pronounced your doom. And so again, you know, here we have that that um, permissive versus causative verb. It's like the Lord has allowed a lying spirit. He doesn't use lies. God doesn't do that. He doesn't lie himself. He doesn't use lies. And someone might say, well, yeah, he did use lies because he's allowing all these prophets to, to stand around and tell lies. He also sent Micaiah to, sell the, to tell the truth. So it's because he knows that even though Ahab knows it's a lie, Ahab is still going to do it because that's just what he wants to do. He knows that it's the wrong way, yet he wants to do it so badly, he's just going to go ahead and do it anyway. And so even so it's like, you know, God God allows that to happen. He allows that deception to happen through all these other prophets, yet he supplies another prophet who tells him the truth. And so God overrules the the lies with a truth teller, so to speak. He 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 over he overrules the lies with a prophet who is willing to speak the truth in the face of a king who does not want to hear it, and it, he doesn't go without being punished for doing right. So, uh, verse twenty-four. Then Zedekiah, son of Canaan, walked up to Micaiah and slapped him across the face. 
Since when did the Spirit of the Lord leave me, leave me to speak to you, he demanded. And Micaiah replied, You will find out soon enough when you are trying to hide in some secret room. Arrest him, the king ordered, king of Israel ordered. Take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to my son Joash. Give them this order from the king. Put this man in prison and feed him nothing but bread and water until I return safely from the battle. But Micaiah replied, If you return safely, it will mean that the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added to those standing around, Everyone mark my words. So King Ahab of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah led their armies against Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, as we, go out into, as we go into battle, I will disguise myself so no one will recognize me, but you wear your royal robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and they went into battle. Meanwhile, the king of Aram had issued these orders to his 32 chariot commanders. Attack only the king of Israel. Don't bother with anyone else. So when the Aramean chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat in his royal robes, they went, they went after him. There is, there is the king of Israel, they shouted. But when Jehoshaphat called out, the chariot the chariot commanders realized he was not the king of Israel, and they stopped chasing him. An Aramean soldier, however, randomly shot an arrow at the Israelite troops and hit the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. Turn the horses around and get me out of here, Ahab groaned to the driver of his chariot. I'm badly wounded. The battle raged all that day, and the king remained propped up in his chariot facing the Arameans. Just, verse 36, just as the sun was setting, the cry ran through his troops, we're done for, run for your lives. So the king died, and his body was taken to Samaria and buried there. Verse 39, The rest of the events in Ahab's reign and everything he did, including the story of the ivory palace and the towns, uh, and the towns he had built, are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. So Ahab died, and his son Ahaziah became the next king. And so some people might say, well, why would they follow this king who you know, is so back and forth and wishy-washy about God? And, and really, he wasn't, really wasn't that wishy-washy about God. He was pretty... He made it pretty clear that he wasn't interested in serving God. Um, it's like because God's God was working so mightily through Elijah, it, he he is like he had to listen, even though he didn't want to, and so he just wouldn't listen all the way to the end. He wouldn't listen, and uh, and so and you say people might say, well, why would someone follow a king like that? Well, on the outward, he's pretty. He, on the outside, he looks pretty successful. You know, he uh, he. He built an ivory palace. He built all these towns. So it looks like he's a pretty successful king. And he he was a kind of charismatic. You know, he was when he tried to get in the boss vineyard the first time, it was like, well, I mean, I'll give you I'll give you a better vineyard. I'll give you, you know. And so he probably looked like a really, um, you know, amiable, compromising guy on the outside. But on the inside, he just would not budge. He would not serve God. And uh, and so it's like so another thing to point out here is that some people might say, look at this and say, well, see, this is how people came up with this idea of karma. You know, uh, Eastern religions are like they talk about that. And it's like kind of like, you know, through a series of events, the universe doesn't let people get away with things. You know, there's this. That's a false concept because there is no idea of mercy, no concept of mercy in the idea of karma. Now, sowing and reaping, on the other hand, has a great deal of mercy involved. And God is the one who in instituted the law of sowing and reaping. It doesn't apply just with natural things. It applies with spiritual things too. And so over and over again, God was so trying to sow mercy into Ahab's life. And Ahab just rejected it every single time. He rejected it all the time. And so it just got to the point where God's like, I mean, now he's got to go under judgment. I'm just going to allow it to happen. And and, and that's what he had you know, a few chapters back. We read about how the, the one prophet had gotten wounded in the eye and and had a bandage and was like told the king told Ahab oh well I got I was injured because I was supposed to guard this guy from the battle the, an enemy soldier and I was doing something else and he got away and the king's like well it's your own fault you were you know and it's like well yeah Ahab it's your own fault that's why you know Jesus talked about by the words of your own mouth you'll either be acquitted or condemned because you know Ahab should have known better in fact he did know better. And so it's just a really unfortunate thing that happened. So uh, verse 41 says, Jehoshaphat, son of Asa, began to rule over Judah in the fourth year of King Ahab's reign in Israel. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 25 years. His mother was Azubah, the daughter of Shalhai. Jehoshaphat was a good king, following the example of his father Asa. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. During his reign, however, he failed to remove all the pagan shrines and the people still offered sacrifices and burned incense there. 
Jehoshaphat also made peace with the king of Israel, which looks like a good thing, but, you know, turns out causes a lot of problems for the southern kingdom after a while. Verse 45, the rest of the events in Jehoshaphat's reign, the extent of his power and the wars he waged are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. Verse 47, there was no king in Edom at that time, only a deputy. And Jehoshaphat also built a fleet of trading ships to sail to Ophir for gold. But the ships never set sail, for they met with disaster in their home port of Ezion Geber. At, that at one time, Ahaziah, son of Ahab, had proposed to Jehoshaphat, Let's, Let my men sail with your men in the ships. But Jehoshaphat refused to request. When Jehoshaphat died, he was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. Then his son Jehoram became the next king. Ahaziah, son of Ahab, began to rule over Israel in the seventeenth year of King Jehoshaphat's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria two years, but he did what was evil in the Lord's sight, following the example of his father and mother and the example of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who had led Israel to sin. He served Baal and worshipped him, provoking the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, just as his father had done. And so, um, you know, all these things are written down for our benefit so that we can learn to follow good examples, and avoid bad examples. Amen. So let's pray. I thank you, Father God, for your word. I thank you that uh, your word is ever present in our lives and in our hearts. Father, I pray that you help us to keep your word before us constantly, Lord God, day and night, be meditating on the word day and night, just like you told your servant Joshua. If you meditate on this word day and night, you'll have good success in all the things that you do. I thank you, Lord God, for your blessings and your mercy. And in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Well, bless you guys, and we will see you again.